I am David Grisanti, as Devin mentioned. I'm a principal engineer at the New York Times. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about our platform, what we're building, and sort of how we're uh, trying to use Intersource to help us build uh, a more sustainable platform. So I'm sure folks are sort of familiar with the New York Times, the brand. Um, you know, our mission is simple. We seek the truth and help people understand the world. And we're aiming to do that by building the essential subscription bundle for every curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world. And I think most folks are probably familiar with our, our news product, but uh, where the technology piece comes in and what I'll talk a little bit more about is, you know, all these other sort of products that we have that we need to support. Uh, so games like Wordle and, uh, you know, connections and all, you know, the new games we're launching, Crosswords. Uh, we have a pretty big cooking uh, presence. Uh, audio, and then there's two sort of properties that have been sort of acquired over the last 10 years, Wirecutter and The Athletic. The Athletic is a sports journalism uh, property. So, you know, all these things sort of make up this bundle that we're supporting and uh, what all the technology powers. And really, we're, a, you know, a, a digital first experience at this point. You know, we still print a paper, but a lot of the work goes into creating articles like the one you see on the screen here, uh, which is a 3D rendering of the Maui wildfires using Google Earth and sort of rendering text and, and video and images all sort of on the screen. So these sort of interactive news stories, as we call them, are something that we want our journalists in the newsroom and also um, engineers who work in the newsroom to be able to create, you know, without really worrying about how they're run in production and, you know, what type of tools they need to, to use to make these besides just writing the sort of business logic. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today, like I said, about the platform, just to give a quick introduction, go over a little bit of the architecture, uh, talk about the challenges sort of, you know, we've been having, and then so sort of where Intersource, I think, has been helping and where I see it could help in the future. Uh, so for, for folks who are not familiar, uh, an internal, an IDP, sometimes it's internal developer platform, sometimes the P is portal, depending on the company you're talking to, um, you know, is really a set of standardized uh, self-service tools and technologies tied together by platform engineers to provide developers with an easy way to follow a golden path for building an app. And the platform team ideally should treat uh, the developer portal like a product and provide services to engineers that are working on applications. And, you know, we sort of look at our uh, developer platform as providing a few set of key features. Uh, so application configuration management, infrastructure orchestration, uh, environment management, and deployment management. So you're sort of getting all the things that you need to run your application in production, monitor it, um, deploy it, uh, all packaged up by us in sort of this uh, quote unquote platform. And at the time specifically, we're building a shared platform um, that has a set of tools and capabilities that anyone at the times can use to accelerate their work. So as, whether it's cooking or games or you know a, somebody in the newsroom, uh, that might be writing a story uh, and wants to get it published. Um, you know, we're trying to create the one place for them to go. Um, and this sort of platform aligns with our enterprise technology goal of using technology and data to propel our growth. So if you look at sort of the ideal state of an application developer, right, they want to develop software, but over the last, you know, 10 or so years, we've sort of thrown all of this stuff at them, right? They have to worry about not just developing, but also figuring out how to containerize things. What, you know, artifact registry do they use? How do they push it there? Authentication to that thing. Provisioning their code, whether that's infrastructure as code with Terraform or some other tool, configuration management, uh, writing pipelines to build, test, and deploy their software, depending on the sort of the CI and CD tools that you're using. Um, you know, how are how is traffic routed to the application? dealing with, you know, multi-region or disaster recovery scenarios, network policies, and then also monitoring, right? We've got come a long way, I think, in the monitoring space with things like open telemetry, but there's still sort of a lot of details left to the developer to figure out um, with sort of the metrics logging and tracing perspective, even if you're using a sort of centralized tool. Uh, so we're trying to sort of simplify this all so that everything except for the developed is sort of uh, packaged together and has a sort of golden path for people. Uh, so from the architecture perspective, like the the way the world looked for us before and it look, looks for a lot of people is you sort of have, you know, all these feature teams where all the devs are sort of uh, 
had their roles expanded to be some form of a DevOps engineer, whether they're maintaining how their applications are deployed, but they're also in many ways managing the underlying infrastructure. And even in cases where they're using a mix of cloud tools, you know, AWS or GCP, um, that abstract away running something like Kubernetes for you, they're still managing upgrades. They're still making decisions on like, should this be single cluster or multi-cluster responsible for lifecycle upgrades, monitoring and all that, all of that. And our goal is to sort of abstract that away from the feature teams and sort of package everything into a set of shared clusters across environments that, you know, we and the delivery engineering team, which is the name of our org, uh, you know, maintain for developers. That's these multi set of multi-tenant clusters uh, that are shared and monitor and maintained and upgraded and stuff by us. So the sort of life cycle of the thing that we're building is we have this sort of create onboarding um, step for uh, developers that they can use that creates um, a GitHub repo, CICD pipelines, um, traffic routing, and all the Kubernetes stuff that they need to deploy their app. Uh, it'll create that in a source control location. Um, like I mentioned, CICD pipelines. And then there's you know the runtime environment, which is our case is based on Kubernetes. Uh, a cloud account for them to use to put any kind of managed infrastructure that they might want that would be outside of the Kubernetes space. And then ingress logic so that they can actually route stuff to their um, end users and not have to worry about WAF or DDoS or um, sort of fiddling with authentication mechanisms. Um, and then underneath all of that, there's an observability layer that's uh, maintained by us that includes logging, metrics, and tracing collection and a tool that they can use to visualize that. Uh, so I'm, what I'm gonna do next is we're going to some of the challenges and you'll notice here that there's sort of colors on each of the boxes and I'll explain uh, what those colors mean in a second. So each of these colors sort of represents a component within our platform and in many ways it represents a team. So when you know the team was built and this stuff was you know sort of uh, getting created, we were at different stages of building out these components and, and building out the teams. And really the runtime and the cloud and the ingress were sort of prioritized first. Um, and then sort of the CICD parts were there in the beginning, but came a little later. And then the create and onboard sort of came last. And I think what we've sort of had a challenge with is that as the teams have built out these, these components and these pieces is that they're, you know, we're talking to each other, but, you know, everyone sort of has different priorities and, um, timelines and the different numbers of developers and everything that like these, all these pieces have sort of gotten built independently um, and they work together, but there's sort of cracks in some of that, that we've seen. And it's easier said than done when you say like, okay, team that works on the create onboard uh, component, please work with the team that's, that's on the runtime side to make sure that you're not making decisions that affects the other, you know, through sort of shared um, contracts or whatever for, APIs and those sorts of things. But in some cases that sort of breaks down if one team gets ahead of the other or um, starts working on something too soon. Uh, then, then the last piece is really like what happens if you want to have some type of user interface or a developer portal on top of this uh, that we've sort of started looking into in the last six months or so. And the, the I think the biggest use case for our biggest, the most common thing in this space is Backstage. Uh, which we are using at the moment, but not as a fully fledged developer portal yet. Um, so that's some of our challenges really. It's like, how do we make sure all these components work together well? And how do we sort of share um, code across teams um, when there are sort of common use cases? So what I want to talk a little bit about is where we've sort of leaned into Intersource and where we've um, seen some successes. So um, before I start this, I just want to mention that we don't, I don't know for folks on the call or who may be listening later, um, I'm not sure if this is true for everyone, but we don't have, you know, an open source program office or any sort of folks inside the company sort of focused on open source or inner source. Um, this is sort of run by the engineers. Um, so I started socializing some of these ideas around maybe la late last year because um, I was, you know, sort of familiar and involved with inner source stuff at my previous company and was kind of um, familiar with the patterns and um, saw some opportunities to, to lean into this to see where it would help us. So, um, you know, what I found success with, and I think is a good way of looking at it, is sort of introduce the concept slowly, explain what inner source is, explain what the benefits are, and focus on a few patterns. Uh, so for us, the 
ones I focused on were core team, the standard based documentation and standard release process for one particular project, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and then sort of look for like a first project to use. Uh, I think I found last year when I was trying to introduce the concepts, uh, people sort of understood it, but in, I think it it didn't really stick until I found a project to sort of use and evangelize um, within the team um, and sort of pushed on that for a while before it took hold. The next was sort of find common ground. Um, so I, the example that I'm going to talk about is an area where there was a lot of friction between teams for like who should be the owner, who should maintain it. You know, we sort of had the, it's everyone's responsibility, but no one's responsibility problem. Um, and, you know, use that to extract what's possible and make available as a, you know, inner source library or module, depending on uh, sort of what, um, you know, development language you're in or what frameworks you might be using. And the other thing was sort of find champions um, or, you know, sort of um, folks who are willing to sort of take some of this on with you that may not be just one person. So I was looking for like-minded people who are um, you know, passionate about this and, you know, formalize an agreement on an ownership model with some of these people. So get, you know, sort of a group onboarded in the beginning. So if I go back to that template sort of workflow uh, thing in the beginning, the, one of the boxes that was there was the create sort of onboard piece. Uh, so I want to walk through sort of how this works in a little bit more detail and then highlight the example that I want to talk about. So let's say we have a team, they fill out this, this form, uh, and they're like, I want to create a new application called X, and it's in written in Golang. And you know, here's my um, my team name, and here's my Slack channel, and they click go. And what happens is we take that information based on the language that they picked in their team. We create a Git repository for them with a standardized Go template that we built. Uh, inside that Git repository it contains the CI CD pipelines they need to deploy to our platform. It contains all their Kubernetes YAML that they need for that app. Um, and it, crea it creates you know, secret policies and uh, stuff that we need for, for tenantization in Kubernetes. And all of that's done through, through Drone, which is our CI tool as sort of an orchestrator uh, to create stuff in, in Git and then Vault, which we use for secrets. And then we use Argo CD for our deployments. And then ultimately that gets deployed into runtime. So in theory, all developers have to sort of do is fill out this form and they get all this stuff sort of dropped in a repo for them. Um, there's some some manual steps in here, like approvals for Vault and so on. But, you know, within an hour or so, once that stuff is approved, um, you'll have a running application in, in our development cluster, you know, ready for you to look at. And then the code is available for you to start playing with and making changes. Uh, so specifically, though, what I want to talk about is inside that Git repo, um, we had this sort of templatized Kubernetes YAML that we were uh, putting in the repository for people. That sort of like used it used customize, and it had a lot of YAML sort of in that, especially for developers who were sort of unfamiliar with uh, Kubernetes as a concept. And even if they are, this looks a little daunting. And we got a lot of feedback from people that said, you know, I don't. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this YAML. Am I supposed to maintain it myself? Are you maintaining this? You know, what changes can I make? And it sort of ran the gamut, I think, of people who would make a bunch of changes, people who wouldn't touch it. It sort of um, depended on the person. But you can imagine, like, as we create a bunch of new repositories and applications for people, this idea could sort of ex expand. And um, every team is sort of treating the YAML differently. And what we found was that you know, this templated YAML contains everything they need for the platform. Um, but we're sort of have this maintenance issue where like, we want to make updates to it if we need to push out a bug fix or something for the platform. But if they also change it, then we introduce some drift. Um, folks are having trouble sort of keeping, keeping in line with it. You know, how do we keep this updated over time? How do we sort of share ownership um, across the, the components of within the YAML? So, you know, the YAML contains things not only for their application scaling parameters and all of that, but it may contain specific things that are, you know, in our Kubernetes runtime that we built in with Kubernetes operators or the like. Um, so what we wanted to say was how can we sort of take this YAML, extract it from the repo, but also make it something that's sort of maintained across teams. So what we sort of tried 
recently and have had success with is that we pulled that pulled out all that YAML and sort of made a platform Helm chart uh, that's specific to the to the times and also specific to our platform. So the idea here is we extracted out all the common platform YAML into this chart. And we created sort of a, a core team and a shared ownership model uh, of all the YAML in the chart. So the chart can, contains, you know, um, monitors for the applications that are maintained by our observability team. It create it has you know ingress logic for the ingress layer that's maintained by our edge team, um, and then sort of uh, deployment parameters for um, for Argo that are maintained by the CI/CD team. So we have you know, the a single team sort of being the core team, um, and then this group of sort of contributors in each team uh, that help to sort of maintain it. Uh, and what that ended up with is that we were we were able to sort of remove that big set of YAML that I showed and sort of have something that looks like this, which is um, just a values file that and customization file that referenced the chart um, at a specific version. And from the user's perspective now, all they really need to worry about is um, updating entries in those in the values files to do things like scaling parameters. Um, and you know, it's easy for us to add customizations as we go now because the chart is sort of independent. We can update it um, independently, and then they can sort of opt in to new features or bug fixes as they need by just update, updating the version in the customization file. And you know, I talk about how we got the platform team involved, but one of the things we'd like to also do is um, get the non-platform teams involved. So for folks that are, um, you know, outside of our team, they may have common use cases that they want to build uh, in their own applications that they could share across many apps. So the way they were doing that before is they would have, you know, again, a lot of YAML sort of mixed in their repos. And we've sort of been talking with them about making their own charts that they would maintain, but that can be referenced in that same customization file I was showing earlier. So it sort of creates a, a bigger inner source model um, all on the same idea where, you know, we're creating this repository of Helm charts that are really just used for applications within the times. Um, so like the expanding on that idea a little bit, I'm talking a lot about the YAML, but if we look back at this bigger picture, you know, CI, CD, runtime and ingress, um, they all sort of have similar things that can be extracted, whether it's Kubernetes YAML or in the CI CD case, um, there are common, you know, deployment patterns um, or testing patterns that could be extracted into sort of, you know, if you're using GitHub actions could be like marketplace actions. Um, in our case, you know, we're using drones, so they could be packaged into sort of drone templates. Um, so we're sort of looking at these other areas to see if there's places we can expand um, this idea a bit more. Uh, to get more teams involved and just have sort of more common uh, things across teams within our within our platform team. Uh, so with that, I just want to wrap up with uh, some lessons learned, I think, from my experience with this so far, and also just trying to bring InnerSource to um, a company or some teams who are sort of not familiar with it. So I think InnerSource Commons and using the available patterns was really helpful. Uh, I think for folks who are sort of unfamiliar with inner source, the idea, like making the idea concrete in their concrete in their head, it helps to have sort of a reference to send them with um, the available patterns and sort of a, a big backlog of talks like this that people can watch and sort of reference to, to kind of cement the idea in their head. Um, the adoption and partnership thing I think was big in terms of, I mentioned before, finding champions in the org uh, or within the team to sort of help you. Um, I think it took a while, but as people saw more engineers sort of contributing and getting involved, um, it was easier to like sort of convince someone else, like, you know, you want to add this feature, you don't need to just open an issue on the other team's backlog, you know, you can you can make those few small changes yourself by opening a pull request. And the, once we had that going, the momentum definitely picked up and we had more people um, contributing. And then the last thing was just feedback. I think you know, being open to changing your mind about things and just changing uh, processes was something that I found was helpful just going through this. I think in the beginning, you know, if you just throw the inner source idea out there and folks don't respond, um, it's easy to sort of step back and say, okay, this isn't going to work out. But um, I sort of pushed on it a lot and got tried to get feedback from people to see why they weren't engaging or what they were concerned about. 
Um, and that sort of helped, you know, sort of move things along a bit. And, and we definitely had a lot of success with that. Uh, so with that, I just want to wrap up and say thanks. And I think we can move on to Q&A.